and the man who put the ball in the English net in Stuttgart is on the line. Ray Howden, good afternoon. Hi, John. Sad day for you, Ray. Really sad day, and we're sorry. Uh, he was a yeah, great man. Yeah, he was a great man. You're absolutely right. And all the tributes that you've had uh, today from all the variety of people is is worthy of the man, isn't it? You know, he was an absolute legend. That word was overused, as we know, but not for Jack. You know, when you think of his career with Leeds United and what he achieved there, uh, and obviously going on with England to win the World Cup in 66. There are plenty of tried before it with England and plenty of tried it afterwards, but they're the only team that done it in 66, so they should be well rewarded for that. Uh, and obviously what he did with Ireland when he came in and the transformation in the country and the way football was viewed, if you like, after that. Oxford uh, United in the 80s, uh, Ray, how did this all happen with you and Jack? Yeah, in 1985, I was uh, playing at for Oxford against Aston Villa in the League Cup first leg. And actually, Jack had come to watch John Aldridge. He, he knew that John had uh, a connection with Ireland. Obviously, he was on the lookout for a new, a new faces to come in for his first game against uh, Wales the following year. Uh, so he was just looking for, for new players. And after the game, one or two of the reporters had said to Jack that I was eligible because of my father was born in Donegal. So he asked me to come and join the, uh, the national setup. Um, it's actually quite funny because he said to me, I'll give you a couple of days to think it over. Uh, and I said, that's fine, yeah, that's great. I'll go and speak to my girls and my, and my father. Uh, nine o'clock the next morning, the phone went, and there was Jack on the line saying, have you made your mind up? So I said, what, what happened a couple of days, Jack? He said, I can't wait that long, I need the answer now. And I, of course I said, yes, and it was the best decision I ever made. I mean, he really transformed my career and you know, went on to Liverpool after that as well and had... European champs in two World Cups, you know, it was a phenomenal time to be part of that Irish setup. What was it like coming over to Dublin at the time, playing with the lads in that European campaign and then going off to Germany for the first one? Yeah, absolutely superb. And, and you know, we talk about Jack, and we know the lads are sure have all been telling you stories of things that went on. But what we don't talk at times is these tactical notes. And if you think back to the qualification for 1988, we, we actually went to Scotland. And we played with uh, Paul McGrath at uh, right back and Roddy Wheeler at the left back. And that was to nullify you know, the two wingers. I think they might have been Pat Nevin and certainly David Cooper. was in great form for Rangers. And he was the one that everyone was you know, talking about in the build-up to the game and how he can win the Scotland. So Jack just changed the, 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 you know, the team selection, if you like, the day before. We hadn't practiced it. There was no prior knowledge he was going to do it. But that was what he went with. And I think David Cooper... But brought up at half time, he had such a bad game, and Big Paul had done so well against him. But uh, you know that was that was one of the things. But actually, tactical awareness, and he knew where the strength of that Scotland team was, and how he wanted to nullify it. When I spoke to Kevin Cheedy earlier on in the show, Ray, I asked him, did Jack send him to him after he put the ball in the English net in '90? Did he send it to you after '88? Did he need to? But what he said to me in '88 was, uh, "Don't ever do that again." And I thought <laughs> he meant score against England. To be honest, but he said. No, don't score that early. He said, that was the, eight, the longest 84 minutes of my life. Uh, so, yeah, that was typical of Jack. He's great humour, great humility. He's a very humble man, but uh, a very wise man at the same time. I think the thought character he was, John, you would be in a room, 300 people in there could be chatting away. The doors would open, Jack Charlton would walk in, and everyone would go silent because there's that much respect for him. Ray, can I just come in there? Because... I think uh, it's Dan McDonald here, Ray. You, uh, I, I think you, you've, you've experienced so many great sides of Jack, but I think you told us a story before about Wembley in 1991, which is like one of the, one of the great <laughs> Irish performances. Unfortunately, one time you didn't put the ball in the English net, but the, Jack, Jack, Jack cut you down afterwards, I believe. I think he. Oh, Daniel, uh, I told you that story. It's an absolute true one. You know, obviously I'm missing absolute sitter to win the game and. You know, after the after the match, I was waiting for Jack to come in and berate me and tell me off and one thing and another. So after the match, I've got into the changing room, not a word. I jump into the uh, the big bath at, at, at Wembley, which I can actually go under. Now, when he uh, only came up to Niall's uh, waist, but me, I could go right under. And I was hiding from him, got my tracksuit on, sneaked out, went up to the players' lounge, very uh, impressed that I got away with any of the killing off of him only to find the door was banging and then I could see this apparition which was Jack Charlton at the end of the room and it was a massive big bar that we were in and he only died for me. People were going up and congratulate him. It's a Charlton when your team done very well this evening. It was a good result for him. And he's just shaking their hands, being a bit polite, but he's just got eyes transfixed on me and he came marching across and he just gave me the 
you could have been a hero again. How did you miss that? And screaming at me. Everyone's listening to me. I'm just nodding my head. And he walked away. My wife said to me, you're going to let, let him speak to you like that. I said, after that, unless he can say what he wants to do. And that was a true story. But, but when it came to the giant stadium, Ray, you, you put it in the net then. Well, I did, but he said to me, well, and he said afterwards, he said he didn't mean that because he doesn't know the kick we play. So he's not the one to play, in fairness, at times like that. But it was all tongue in cheek. You know, I, I knew like, there were only four people in my life who would call me Raymond uh, my mum and dad, my wife, and Jack Jones. We've heard so much love today, Ray, for the fact that he was just what you see is what you got. And uh, he told you how to play, you played the way you. He asked you to play, and the rest of the time it was it was light and shade. It was a bit of fun, uh, and you you enjoyed the wins, and you you worked hard, and you played hard. Uh, one of the things, one of the great attributes that he, he had, John, uh, and he had quite a few, but one of them was he treated you like men. He understood as players, as a former player. So I don't. And by the way, he came from a Leeds team, a Leeds team that had real top quality players and hard men, if you like, uh, and who knew how to look after themselves. Off, on and off the pitch, if you, if you know what I mean. And he wanted us to be like that. He wanted a group really tight and knit because we didn't have hundreds of players to call upon. You know, we, we had a small group of players that we were reliant on game after game. And Jack was very loyal uh, on most occasions with, with, with the players. But he wanted that bond. He wanted that spirit. And he would, he would you know, try and enforce it upon us. You know, you're all together. You're as one. When you go out there, we're a team. And I think that was hugely important for the success that we we had. And listen, and Daniel will tell you, he didn't suffer fools lightly. I mean, if, if you were a press lad and you asked a, a, a silly question, he'd let you know, Daniel. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let you off. Wouldn't he? he would turn and tell you, no in certain terms. No, was, and I, was, and I didn't expect you asked. <laughs> I didn't experience it really, but I've heard it. But I'm actually, I'm actually wondering, like, and Vincent Hogan mentioned this earlier on. He said that all the times, like, you know, Jack was a World Cup winner, but he never really brought it up. He wasn't, yeah. you see some managers who can't help but talk about what they did. I'm kind of wondering, like, as to players, did he speak much about his own career, what he did, what he achieved? Did he tell stories? Or was that something that he, he left out of any discussions with you guys? Oh, that's a great point, you know. He never mentioned that. And funny enough, I actually went up to interview him uh, at his house and about five, six years ago, it might be a little bit long, but around about that time. And I've never seen a World Cup winner's medal before. So I said to him, have you got your medal in the house? And he said, yeah. He said, do you want to see it? I said, I'd love to see it. So he went upstairs and he came down a few minutes later and he brought down a little box, which you get from any hardware store for about three pounds. And I said to him, you've not got your World Cup winner's medal in there. And he went, yeah. yeah. And he just opened up this little box with a little key and he opened it up. And there was his, uh, I think it was the FA Cup, the league title and his World Cup winning medal in this little box and I thought you know what that Jack Jones that just sums him up perfectly there there's no ones and graces about him he's just a very humble man working class background and what a, what a, what a fella Did he speak uh, Ray about how the game changed and how international football then progressed with uh, Mick and with uh you know, World Cup 2002 and the subsequent managers to that and the way the Irish team might not have um, reached the heights that it did under him and the way the Premier League emerged and uh, the way football has changed and the money influx into the game and uh, the fact that it's become a global league. Did you ever uh, ever have a chat with him about uh, how things moved on after he left? Yeah, do you know one of the things, uh, John, he loved Ireland. You know, and he had houses, as you say, in Valley Bottom. One thing, he loved his fish, he loved his shooting. I mean, he was revered in Ireland. I think, didn't he get the freedom of Dublin, Dublin at one stage? And I think, you know, there were so many awards that he received over there. Uh, he was a major part of his life. Uh, so, yeah, he had a really keen eye on what was going on with the international team. And obviously, he, he wanted them to be every bit as successful uh, or even more successful than we were. And, and that was what his ambition was. He loved football. Once it's in your blood, like he was, you know, you, you can't switch it off. If you've been a manager when he's with Middlesbrough, wasn't he? Newcastle, Sheffield, Wednesday, the Republic of Ireland. When you've been a manager that long, you know, you just don't you just stop thinking about it. I'm sure he still, you know, was very keen on what was going on internationally, domestically. He still went to games because I was asking about it. He was still going to Newcastle a few years ago to, to watch matches. He still, for me, was still in love with the game. He still loved what it was about. Um, and he had, don't forget, he had an incredible career at Leeds United. Have, have a look back at the number of games that he played and people tend to forget that. And I'm sure Johnny, I remember Johnny, I don't know if he mentioned, I think you said you, you had Johnny on today, I don't know if he mentioned that, but Johnny said that there was a time with, uh, with Leeds that, that was the best 
over half in England at that particular time. No, it's like Rage from Johnny. How will he be remembered, uh, Rage, I think, in this country? Well, I hope, hope hopefully, uh, John, with great affection, uh, you know, he's been with, with great respect because, you know, he came in at a time where we, we hadn't qualified. We had some fantastic players before Jack qualified. We had some fantastic managers. We just never got that rub of the green, if you like. They didn't have that little bit of luck, but we certainly had it. You know, when Scotland went to Bulgaria and, and, and got that win, which got us qualified. But I think most people in Ireland will, sit, will have great affection for him because, you know, there wasn't a bad bone in, in him. You know, he was just a lovely fella. He always had time for people. Uh, you know, he, he loved his pint of Guinness. He loved his little whiskey. You know, that he loved his little dram. Uh, and he was just a, a great character. And I'm sure that came across to the Irish public. Well, Ray Houghton, you're an absolute gentleman for joining us on Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk here today. Thanks so much for uh, paying your tribute to Jack Charlton. Thank you.